April 18, 1906, one of the worst natural disasters in U.S. history. About 300 miles of the San Andreas Fault moves as much as 28 feet. The Salinas River changes course, permanently, by six miles. Unreinforced brick buildings crumble like so much sand. San Francisco and nearby cities are laid waste, and ensuing fires ravage thousands of wood frame buildings. Over 3,000 people lose their lives. Back then, our understanding of earthquakes was meager. While predicting earthquakes remains unattainable, our ability to prepare for and mitigate quake damage has advanced greatly over the last century and promises to improve into the future. That's because here, 100 years later, students from across the country have come to the Peer Undergraduate Seismic Design Competition to test their ingenuity at designing seismically robust buildings. With support from the National Science Foundation, the competition was conducted by Peer, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, along with EERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. The Peer Center uh, is a collection of universities uh, and industry partners working together to develop what we call performance-based engineering. And uh, performance-based engineering is all about how to design structures, uh, taking into consideration the real ground motions that are expected, real behavior of the structure, and ultimately how it performs. Uh, so, so we can build structures uh, that will perform the way society and owners want them to. I think it's a great opportunity you know, for these students to be able to participate uh, in, a, in this 100th anniversary conference, um, not only for the competition and for the, for the di design aspects, but also to be around a lot of the prof you know, acting professionals and practitioners um, to see what it, what it is really like on the outside world and get a, some view, some, a view um, of what it might be like once they graduate and go out for, and go to look for a job in industry. Uh, what I like to see as a faculty member is that the students get to uh, apply what they're learning in class in a practical um, in a practical situation and then they get to see the results. They spend a lot of time doing computer analyses and hand calculations but here they really get to look at um, they really get to see how their structure performs. They get to analyze it and then see how it works. To address the goals of performance-based engineering Peer challenged teams to design a multi-level office building that would not only survive some of the worst earthquakes recorded, but also achieve architectural and economic excellence. The buildings were constructed of balsa wood and glue. Built to 172nd scale, the buildings are limited to a height of 2 meters and a footprint of 18 inches. This makes each story scaled to about 12 feet high, with about 38 floors total height. Mechanical dampers were allowed, and at least one team used them as a structural element at the base of their building. This is our foundation system, and it's a damping system. There's a cork casing that encompasses the columns, the shell columns and the core columns. And essentially, the columns aren't actually attached to the base plate, just the cork system is. So the column sits within the base plate and is allowed to sort of rock back and forth as the structure moves, causing friction between the cork and the column and it dissipates some of the energy. Some used internal shear walls in the core of the building. I feel that ours is going to be a winning design because we've simplified it and not made it too complex. We basically have a shear wall core in the middle that um, carries the load. The exterior, all this design on the outside, the, the spiraling effect and things like that, is not structural at all. All the structural load, the weights and everything are carried down through the shear wall. So the aesthetics, we could get really intricate with the aesthetics and things like that because they're not really carrying the load. Designs varied from straightforward and robust to graceful. Students worked diligently on their entries and took a variety of approaches to address the many considerations of performance-based design. We realized that, uh, that to increase the floor space you have to make the building square and we figured everybody else is going to do that and that's not really an architecturally uh, uh, it's not different. Everybody else is going to do that. So we decided to go with the octagon. Although that would sacrifice some of our floor space, we figured we could win on the architectural part. Our performance is based upon minimizing roof acceleration and drift ratio of the entire structure. We're basically trying to put a soft story to roof isolate 
the roof acceleration. So what we have is pin-pin connections on the top, so that makes the roof very flexible laterally, horizontally. And then we place these dampers to damp out energy. Now the problem with that is we need some sort of returning force so that after the motion, the soft story will have to return to its center equilibrium point. Now with just the damper, that's not enough returning force. So what we had to do was put springs in an angle on the, on the damper so that it would provide some returning force. Now the problem is that we have to keep a, find a balance. The more stiffer that we make the springs, the, the more stiffer the soft story will be, so it will be less effective on damping out energy. But we want the springs to be stiff enough so that it can return to equilibrium. These are uh, braces and they are pretty much just for show. <laughs> they don't add too much structural um, structural significance. The most, uh, the, I think it has the most um, structural performance is these, the columns that run up and down. They, are, they pretty much are the strongest uh, element. These, these are pretty thin. Uh, we just kind of, we worked with architecture and they just told us, you know, if we stick on a nice diagonal, it gives it some character <laughs> and it's pleasing to the eye. And I think that's, that's important too. Instead of just a rigid cross brace, which makes the building stiffer, where it connected, we decided to put a piece of sandpaper in there and allow the, the joint to move and actually be open. And the sandpaper will create a friction that'll take energy out of the building itself. So it, it won't move as much in both directions. It might slide in one direction, but as it tries to move back from the earthquake displacement, it'll actually end up losing energy and slow itself down just by the friction within the joints. The winner will not just survive the quakes. The team with the highest annual building revenue wins the competition. This revenue is derived from a combination of construction costs, costs of damage and losses, and revenue from usable square footage. A huge component of the challenge is the technical presentation, where the students must clearly articulate their design rationale and show how they arrived at it. So as what we did is we devised a constant floor plan that rotates around the shear core in 15 degree in increments, which provides a complex structure that's still very elegant. For the income, we used a floor plan that maximizes the, the maximum allowable space, um, resulting in a floor plan of each level has approximately 0.115 meters squared. Um, and the total is 2.94 meters squared. We, as you can see, we've um, punched door holes in the shear core, allowing the interior core to be used, um, to be counted as usable space. This results in a, in a plan that um, brings in a little over $1.84 million per year. Another feature which enhances the aesthetics of the building are the diagonal members which draw the appearance together and attract your eye upward along the height of the building. Of course, the most interesting feature of the structure is not the appearance, but the structure itself. Our building utilizes an innovative uh, decoupled system in which the inner core is designed to be more flexible than the outer floor system, and both are independent, joined only by dampers, which allow them to play against each other and cancel out each other's movements, reducing damages in the structure. Our major focus was on the construction method itself, because in our past modeling we know that there's, failure happens in a joint, and there's a lot of joints in the system, and in order to have the, redu the redundancy in the building, we had to ensure that we made a quality joint. So we, we notched each beam and created half-lap joints and cross-lap joints, which are less, less of a mess to create, and they're more aesthetically pleasing than a, a, gusset a butt end joint with a gusset plate. We are focusing on costs, right? As everybody here is focusing on costs because money moves the world. But I tend to disagree. I think innovation moves the world. So what we're really trying with our structural elements is we're trying new concepts. We've seen shear walls. We've seen uh, cross bracing, right? So we're going to try something different, something more innovative. We wanted to focus on architecture, focus on space. Our, our design is based off of two things. It's based off of a core, which is, supports all our gravity loads and lateral loads, and it's based off of a, a non-structural shell. In the final analysis, everyone is here to see the buildings perform in quake testing. To do this, the models are placed on a shake table, which will replicate the ground motions of three devastating quakes. 
the 1940 El Centro, the 1994 Northridge, and the 1995 Kobe earthquakes. Metal rods are added to simulate building loads. At the top and bottom of the models, sensors are placed to reveal two important parameters in calculating damage. Roof drift, or how far the building sways, and roof acceleration, or how fast it sways. A combination of these measurements helps the judges determine how well the building performs. You can imagine if a building drifts too far too fast, that things inside are not going to fare well in an earthquake. With that, the testing begins. This structure we're going to shake first with the 1940 El Centro earthquake. Okay. The next earthquake is the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Okay. Our next earthquake is going to be the 1995 Kobe earthquake. Kobe earthquake. Go. After being subjected to the required quakes and recording the performance data, the organizers put on a show. The models were taken to extremes, both rapid violent shaking and something called a sign sweep. A sign sweep finds the building's natural sway frequency and then repeatedly subjects the structure to that frequency. It's much like an opera singer's voice breaking a wine glass, and sometimes the results are unmistakably similar. Okay, the, uh, the team said they don't have a box to ship it back to Washington. So uh, we're going to go ahead and just shake it at its natural frequency and see what happens. However, in some cases, student ingenuity and design trumped the best efforts of the shake table and survived the demolition derby unscathed. Okay, here we go. Stand back. <laughs> All right, I think somebody's beaten the shake table. Eddie? We'll take it home. I, th I think we've been beaten. <laughs> Well, the, I guess the grand champion, the first place team of the third annual Pierce Seismic Competition with an annual rental income of $2.25 million a year is another Pierce school, University of Washington. Thank you. You did a great job. Good job. Thank you 
Congratulations. Good job. Thank you. While the University of Washington was awarded first place, in the end, every team was a winner. Students had an invaluable experience, putting theory to the test and making their ideas reality.